It is my great pl uh, pleasure to introduce uh, a plenary speaker. Uh, Professor Raul Pandari Pande got a PhD from uh, Harvard University in 1994. Since then, he worked at the uh, University of Chicago, uh, Cal uh, Caltech, Princeton University, and has been professor at the uh, ETH Zurich since 2011. He has got the numerous honors, uh, just to mention a few. Uh, ICM invited the panel speaker at, at ICM 2002 at Beijing, Compositio Prize 2010, Clay Research Prize uh, 2000, uh, 2013, and Infosys Prize for Mathematics in 2013. His particular interests concern moduli spaces, enumerative invariants associated to moduli spaces, uh, and uh, Donaldson Thomas invariants, and cohomology of the moduli space of curves. And his ti uh, the title of his talk today is Geometry of the Moduli Space of Curves. Please. That's a light. This is the, the pointer, so the pointer, be careful. Yeah. OK, so this points there. OK, thank you very much for the introduction. It's wonderful to be in Rio, and I'm, uh, it's a great honor to speak here today. I will speak about the moduli of curves. And we will start. Hmm. No. I'm afraid I'm not able to do it. The green button? Ah, here it is. OK. So we'll start with uh, the simplest. That's uh, the Riemann sphere. It has already appeared in uh, the lectures. So the Riemann sphere is a compact, one-dimensional complex manifold. And it is uh, obtained by adding a point at infinity. No, I'm not working this correctly. Ah, here's the light. It's obtained by uh, uh, adding a point at infinity to the complex numbers. And uh, it is uh, here depicted as a sphere here. And you can see this as the 0 is the 0 in the complex numbers. And the southern hemisphere, which is where we are now, is the, uh, the unit disk. And so on, many mathematicians first encounter the Riemann sphere in a course in complex variables. And as such, we know it's not just a sphere, a topological sphere of genus 0, but it also has a theory of holomorphic functions. Holomorphic functions and holomorphic automorphisms. And the automorphisms are well known, that the entire set of holomorphisms, by holomorphisms are given by linear fractional transformations. This is a basic result. OK, so that's the Riemann sphere. And the simplest moduli space we'll start with in this talk is the moduli space M0N, the moduli space of n-pointed Riemann spheres. And the 0 here is because it's genus 0. N is for the number of points. And this moduli space parameterizes configurations of exactly n distinct points on the Riemann sphere. And here I use the algebraic geometer's uh, notation for the Riemann sphere, CP1. And it, the, the interesting thing about this is it parameterizes these up to biholomorphisms, so up to those linear fractional transformations that we saw. All right. So the first case of this is for three points. We have three distinct points. And then it's also a result, essentially, from the complex analysis class that there exists a unique linear tra fractional transformation that will take this configuration of three distinct points to 0, 1, and infinity. So this says, up to biholomorphism, there's only one configuration of three distinct points. And this, then, this moduli space is a single point. All right. So that uh, is the very first case. We have, in some sense, no moduli because we just have a single point. So the second case, of course, we want to see moduli, is we consider four points. Then the first three, by the previous discussion, can be taken to the points 0, 1, and infinity. but the value of the fourth point can't be controlled. And that gives us the moduli. That point can be any point here in the Riemann sphere avoiding 0, 1 at infinity. And then that's the moduli space. And this is, can also be thought of as the cross ratio, which is an idea that goes back to Pappas of Alexandria 
in 300 AD, and one can imagine that uh, he spoke about it at the ICM in 302. So the, the idea here of using the cross ratio can be used with any number of points. If you take m0 n, the first three points can be set to 0, 1, and infinity by a unique linear fractional transformation. But then the values of the last n minus 3 can't be controlled, and they can take arbitrary values here, avoiding the diagonals. So here we have an explicit, essentially coordinate way of thinking about this moduli space. So this is the uh, genus 0 story. And while there are many open questions, uh, I will go immediately to higher genus. All right. So higher genus. So here, now we take a Riemann surface as a compact, connected, one-dimensional complex manifold. And the genus is the number of holes of the topological surface. So I've drawn here a genus G surface. In the genus zero case, which is the Riemann sphere that we were considering, there is a unique complex structure. This is an aspect of the Riemann mapping theorem. But in higher genus, when we have some holes, the complex structure can be varied while keeping the topology fixed. And this, var this varying of the complex structure is what we're interested in in this talk. So an algebraic geometer can also view this Riemann surface as an algebraic curve. That's why we say the moduli space of curves. And it's defined by the zero locus in C2 of a single polynomial equation. And this is here, f of x, y equals 0, where these are complex variables. And this is correct up to a few points at infinity. We had to even, in the first case, add infinity to the Riemann sphere. The simplest of these, which is not the Riemann sphere, is the cubic equation, which is given by this basic cubic polynomial. And I, to show you what the zero set looks like, uh, I've plotted here the points in R2. Because it's harder to plot the points in C2, but in R2 it's very simple. And we have this circle. And we have this, and this really is a circle when I add the points at infinity, and I get two circles. And these are the real points of the donut, which is taken by taking a donut and slicing it. And then the slice of the, the two circles. OK, so that's the, that's the cubic equation. And where's the moduli? We get moduli by varying the coefficients. The simplest coefficient we can vary here is the, the two. We can make that a lambda. We get a one-parameter family. And here we get a family of Riemann surfaces of genus 1. And here, lambda changes. And here, the curve changes. It is hard to see complex structure. It's not obvious that the complex structure is changing here. But you can see the sizes of these holes are changing. All right. So this is the first time we've seen actual varying moduli of curves. And so here, following the notation, the genus 0 case, mg is the moduli space of Riemann surfaces moduli space of complex structures you can put up to biholomorphism. There are several approaches to the moduli of curves. So we've seen already complex analysis and algebraic geometry. Uh, another very rich direction is hyperbolic geometry. And this was touched on in the talk of Simon Donaldson. I will not say much about it here, but see, for example, the works of Mirza Khani. We can consider a more topological approach to the geometry of the mapping class group. Also, topological string theory more recently. And of course, we can vary the complex structure of the curve and the points together. And we'll have the data of a Riemann surface with n distinct points. And this is a point in the moduli space MGN. And we'll return to this later in the lecture. So right now, we'll, we'll uh, focus our attention on MG with the moduli of curves. OK. So Riemann studied the moduli space. And he knew that this moduli space was essentially a complex manifold of dimension 3g minus 3. I've tried to draw a picture of this moduli space here. This is the moduli space, which is somehow a manifold. Every point on the moduli space corresponds to a complex structure on a genus g curve. And I've tried to show this varying complex structure here by different color. One thing to remark is if I put g equals 0, I get minus 3, which is an unfortunate uh, number for dimension. And also, genus 1 is special. And those numbers have different interpretations in genus 0 and 1 because of the automorphisms. But for genus 2 and higher, this is exactly correct. And we, knew, we know that Riemann knew these because he wrote it. And so here, and this is an, uh, from his paper in, in 1857. 
theory of abelian functions. Uh, he constructs the variations of complex structure, states the dimension formula, and coins the term moduli in a single sentence. This is a marvelous sentence, and here it is. Uh, of course, for Riemann, his P is our genus. And uh, it would be actually very nice to give a whole lecture on this sentence. It's not my uh, purpose here. But if we look at the end, he says that uh, these curves depend on 3P minus 3 continuously moving parameters, uh, which should be called moduli. And uh, since we're here in Rio, in order to keep my political avenues open, I will also put the Portuguese translation, which I admit I had a little bit of help with. OK, so here's a timeline, a rough timeline, which is relevant to my talk. So I said here in 1857, Riemann imagines the moduli space of curves. Then in the early 20th century, there's a, a, a lot of investigation in low genus by the Italian school, Castelnuovo, Castelnuovo Benjamino Segre, and Severi. And this was very important for the development. There's a lot of phenomena discovered then. Then there's the deline mumford compactification, which comes in the 60s, and this will be discussed later in this talk. Harris Mumford proved the birational complexity of MG. This is also quite important. It means that if you want to study higher genus, we will never find those coordinates we found in genus zero, the ones that I wrote. We'll never find them. Harazagye calculated the topological Euler characteristic. This is a beautiful formula, and one can, uh, one, one can discuss it by saying the best invariant, which is the Euler characteristic, of the best space, which is the moduli space of curves, is the best number, which is the values of the zeta function at negative integers. So then there's the witten kinsevich theory connecting integrals to the KVD, KDV hierarchy. And also in 2007, Mumford's conjecture by Madsen and Weiss. This will come up also later in the talk. So this is some timeline of ideas. And if you look here, the last three entries Haurizage, Witten, Kontsevich, and Madsen Weiss all concern aspects of the cohomology of the moduli space. And my goal here, the central goal of this talk, is to present some new directions, sorry. Present some new directions in the cohomological study which have developed in the past few years. So also, if you look at this timeline, you'll see that uh, the, the last 50 years, ideas of Mumford have played a very central role in the development and I thought that uh, I would uh, end the introduction of this talk by uh, giving Mumford's view in his own words about the moduli space. And he wrote, uh, you can find this in an autobiographical uh, essay. And I just read the quote. This is uh, from David Mumford. So when Oscar Zariski, Zariski was his uh, PhD advisor at Harvard. When Oscar Zariski spoke the words algebraic variety, there was a certain resonance in his voice that said distinctly that he was looking into a secret garden I immediately wanted to be able to do this too, especially I being, became obsessed with the kind of passion flower in this garden, the moduli space of Riemann. And uh, just to refresh your memory, that's what a passion flower is. OK, so this is more or less the end of the introduction to the talk, and now I'll start talking more about the cohomology. So com cohomology, we've also seen several times. Uh, by now at the ICM, but it's an algebraic tool to study the topology of a space, especially in some sense the interaction of the holes of the space, one can say. And the two basic questions for MG one can, uh, can write are what is the cohomology for fixed genus and what is the limit as the genus goes to infinity. And both of these were inspired by uh, work of Mumford in the 70s and 80s, and they follow the study of the Grossmannian by Schubert. And here we have the pictures of uh, uh, Schubert on the left, Grossmann on the right, and they're different generations. And you can see that their facial hairstyle has taken a complementary turn in this generation. <laughs> so about the Grossmannian, this should be a much more familiar space for mathematicians. It is a moduli space, but on the other hand, it's really connected with linear algebra. So the Grossmannian parameterizes all R-dimensional subspaces of a fixed complex space, complex vector spaces. And one can ask the parallel questions. What is the cohomology for fixed n? And what is the limit as n goes to infinity? So we understand here r is fixed always. So, what's, so here n, we can have n fixed, or we can let n go to infinity. And uh, 
the study of this as origins in Schubert's work. And by now, these, you know, it, these are very standard parts of the answers, or standard parts of the geometry cur curriculum. But they were not uh, as standard in the 19th century. In fact, the rigorization of the Schubert calculus was Hilbert's 15th problem. So I want to say a little bit about that so a solution there. Oh, that's unfortunate. Ah. OK, so here is the Grassmannian. And one of the interesting features of uh, the study of its cohomology is it's controlled by a certain bundle, a vector bundle, a geometric object. That's S, and this is the universal subbundle. And I wanted to say what this is. So it's a vector bundle on the Grassmannian. A point on the Grassmannian is given by a subspace. And the vector bundle, I have to tell you a vector space corresponding to that subspace. And the answer is it's that subspace itself. This is the tautological bundle. And since it's tautological, it's a little hard to describe because it's so tautological. But uh, the Grassmannian is, a, is, a, is a, uh, parameterizes a varying family of, of subspaces, and the vector bundle are those subspaces. That's a tautological vector bundle. That's S. And the questions of 1 and 2, these cohomology questions for the Grassmannian, can be uh, answered exactly via this study of this bundle S. So the first statement is that the cohomology of this Grassmannian is generated by the churn classes of S. So what are churn classes? If I have this vector bundle, the churn classes are classes in the cohomology of the base that measure, in some sense, the twisting of this vector bundle. So we saw in, in uh, Donaldson's talk already C1. We will discuss C1 again here later. But uh, here you can just think about this. Uh, given a vector bundle, there are these classes on the base which measure how it twists. And the first statement is that uh, the cohomology is generated by these Turing classes. That's kind of nice. This means that there's no hidden cohomology classes for us here in the Grassmannian. So the answer to the second question is, what is the limit when I take n to infinity? And the answer is that it's just a free algebra on these cohomology classes. There's no relations. So that gives a very nice answer to that question. Then the second question is, what is the ideal of relations? If I fix n, then this is not a free uh, algebra. And uh, I want to tell you the relations. And here, this is a this expression, how to get the relations from this expression, is that you see there's this blue variable t. And this bottom is a, is a function in t. But since it starts with 1, I can take a power series expansion where the t comes on top. And when I do that, I have coefficients. And those coefficients are polynomials in the c. And what I do here is I extract the t to the d coefficient. So the, this answer is a polynomial in the c's. And that's 0. But not for all of them. It's for d's in this range. So this, uh, these two lines give the answer to the question for the Grassmannian. It's generated by these Turing classes. And this, uh, the ideal of relations is given by a rather simple algebraic formula. OK, so if we take this philosophy to the moduli space of curves, the very first question is what is the analog of S, this tautological bundle for the moduli space of curves? And this has a very simple answer. The answer is the universal curve. Over the moduli space, over the Grassmannian, there's a tautological object, which is the vector space. And over the moduli space of curves, there's a tautological object, which is the curve. And here's the picture. If, if, I, if I take a point in the moduli space, that point is given by specifying a particular curve, a particular Riemann surface with its complex structure. And the fiber of the universal curve is that curve. And we've actually seen this curve before. It's the moduli space of genus G Riemann surfaces with one mark point. So we will construct cohomology classes from an intrinsic line bundle on this curve. See, the issue here is that unlike the Grassmannian, where the universal object was linear, the universal object here is nonlinear. It's the curve. Uh, and the idea, when you're faced with a nonlinear object, uh, the, f the first idea to try is to linearize it somehow. And this is what happens here with a complex line bundle. And which line bundle do we take? We take another tautological object. It's the cotangent line over the universal curve. So I said 
this universal curve, you can think of, a, think of it as a moduli space of curves with one point, and then this line bundle is the complex cotangent space at that point. So this, this whole structure is all tautological. Then this is a line bundle. We can define its first churn class. And this first churn class gives me a cohomology class upstairs on the universal curve. So this, this is the second time the churn classes have come. So as I said, the churn classes of a vector bundle, this linear object, define these classes on the base to measure how much it twists. If, if the vector bundle is trivial, then all these classes are 0. The first churn class is the easiest one to approach. And this has a, a way to think about it. This first churn class is actually Poincaré dual to the cycle defined by the zeros and poles of a meromorphic function, meromorphic section of this line bundle. So it's the most concrete churn class. So we're going to use this psi, which is the first churn class of this tautological line bundle on the universal curve. We're going to use it to make lots of classes on our moduli space. And so here it is. It's, so we have a class upstairs. That's the psi. And we can, by integration on the fiber or push down or however you want to get from upstairs to downstairs, you define this class as kappa i. So they're the push forward of the i plus first power of this uh, cotangent line class. These are the kappa, these kappa i classes are the uh, Miller Morita Mumford classes. And they give us lots of classes inside the moduli space. And you can view these as completely analogous to what happens in the Grassmannian. In the Grassmannian, we got these classes which measure how non-trivial the universal subbundle is. And these kappa classes measure how non-trivial a family of curves are, and more or less analogous. So then, if we think about what happened for the moduli of curves, for what happened for the Grassmannian, the first question should be, is this uh, tautological ring, that's the algebra generated by these kappa classes, is this the whole thing? So the answer for the Grassmannian was yes. That was the, the first step in the solution. But here, so here this is now a question. Is this the all of cohomology? And the answer here is, is a more uh, delicate answer. The answer is no. In fact, the answer is obviously no. Because uh, we know, for example, so these, these classes are all even, and we know this, this moduli space can have odd classes. So there's, there's really no chance. But the miracle is that this is yes stably. This was Mumford's conjecture in the Madsen-Weiss theorem. It says that if I take the limit as g goes to infinity here, then that's the free algebra on these kappas. So this, you should, this should remind you of the answer to the, the question for the Grassmannian. OK, so here are David Mumford, Ib Madsen, Michael Weiss. So we take this Mum Mumford's conjecture, the affirmative uh, solution to Mumford's conjecture, as motivation to res restrict our attention to this tautological subring. So those, are those, that's those classes, uh, the algebra generated by the kappa classes. So there's other ways to motivate this. In, in fact, it's a natural subring from other points of view in algebraic geometry. But I think the, the best conceptual motivation is it's the subring given by the stable, the class that are stable. And our questions now are, what is the structure of this tautological ring? And what does that actually mean? It means that this ring, since it's generated by these classes, is surjected upon by this algebra. And what is the structure of this ring? In some sense, means what is this ideal of relations? And that's actually parallel to the way we thought about the Grassmannian. I mean, more or less exactly parallel. OK, so now I will explain this development of the faber zagge conjecture. So via results of Luyanga and Carol Faber, this lower end of this tautological ring was known for some years. So it says that if I I'm in co-dimension greater than g minus 2, and I, I tell you here that when I'm talking about this grading with the kappa classes, I always take out the 2. So here I use the complex grading as opposed to the real grading here, just to save the factor of 2, because they're all even classes. But it's been known for some time that uh, 
if I am in co-dimension greater than g minus 2, that that's 0. And at the top level here, g minus 2, it's one-dimensional. And the study, so once we have a one-dimensional uh, piece here, the bottom of the ring, then there's a, there's a theory of kappa proportionalities that's related to many things. But it's not to the topic I will uh, take today. So I'm interested here today in this full idea of ideal of relations. And the study of this was started by Mumford, but uh, was attacked first systematically by Carol Faber, uh, starting around 1990. And his approach was to use the classical constructions in the, in the algebraic geometry of curves, uh, brill noether theory especially, to find relations among this kappa classes. And roughly speaking, the summary of this is that if you go pick up a, a book on algebraic curves and you take up, open up to any theorem, and if you somehow try to impose that theorem over the moduli space, then you'll get some relation among the kappa classes. And so Carol Faber did this systematically. With, there was a lot of computer work here. So in this period from 1990 to 2000, there was expo exploration of these relations uh, with a mix of geometry and computer work. And uh, then Don Zaguier came together with them. And the outcome of that 10-year uh, period was a discovery a prediction of a certain set of relations, a conjecture for what's called now the faber zagier relations. And I want to explain these relations. So I, I remember that these were, Carol explained these to me around 2000. All right, so I want to explain the relations. So here's Carol Faber and Don Zagier. And so to write the relations, we write down a variable set. And this variable set is a bit odd. I write down all of these, uh, so this is the variable set, but the, in, the uh, index, uh, should not be congruent to 2 mod 3. That means we throw out 2, we throw out 5, we throw out 8, and so on. So that's a strange variable set. And now we write down a function, a series. And the series has the 0 mod 3 variables here and the 1 mod 3 here. And this one's multiplied by a certain hypergeometric series. Now, you know, so there's some mathematicians who love functions, and then this is perfect for you. Other ones, the, uh, for the other people, the thing to take away from this slide is the appearance of this series, this hypergeometric series. It's going to appear three times in this talk. This is the first time. Here it comes again. This is more or less a cousin. So this is a rather explicit function, and it's coming from nowhere here. But since it has a constant term 1, I can take the logarithm. So I take the logarithm. So I take the logarithm of this crazy function that was in the previous. So here's the function, and I take its logarithm. The logarithm has some series expansion. Here I sum over all the t variables, and here I sum over all the p powers. And the, the way this sum is written is uh, indexing the monomial by a partition. And since the variables don't have subscripts, which are 2 mod 3, uh, the summation over partitions is also partitions which avoid parts that are congruent to 2 mod 3. OK. So all I've done is to written down an explicit function that includes its hypergeometric series and taken the logarithm. And the outcome of that is a definition of certain coefficients, these coefficients here. They depend on the power of t and the exponents of the p variables. I have to get the kappas in here somewhere, because the whole point is to get relations in kappas. So I put them in by hand. So it's the same function. Wherever I see a t to the r, I put a capital the r there. And what I'm going to do next is exponentiate, basically exponentiate this function with a sign. So, so you see, we started with a function. We took its log, and now we're going to exponentiate. Normally, if you take a log and exponentiate, you're wasting your time. But I'm not doing that exactly, because in the, mean, in the middle, I'm putting this kappa r here. So there's this new function, exponential of minus gamma. And what's important to know about it is that it's, a, it's explicit. It depends only on the hypergeometric series I started with. And if I take any coefficient here, then the answer is a polynomial in these kappa i's. Right? That's the part that's important. So this should remind you a little bit about what happened with the Grossmannian. And the theorem, so this was proven with myself and Aaron Pixton in 2010, and it was predicted by Faber and Zage in 2000, based on this, uh, their work, that this relation, you take this exponential of this exact function and extract 
this coefficient, this is a polynomial in the capitalist which is zero in, this, on the, in the cohomology of the moduli space of curves. And this holds not for every coefficient, but there's a range. You have to have 3D greater than G minus one, and that's the size of the partition and a congruence condition. So this theorem captures all of that exploration. So it was proven 10 years later, but it captures all of it. The G dependence here is, is kind of uh, small. There's a, it, it, the, the G doesn't appear here. It appears in the inequalities and the congruence condition. So it's, it's almost something that's not, uh, well, the, the G dependence is, in the answer is not very much. And for every genus and co-dimension, the theorem provides finitely many relations. Okay. So if you want to see an example, in genus six, which is a relatively low genus, if you put in some of these uh, parameters, you get relations, and here they are. Uh, so you see the coefficients are rather large. You, cannot, you can manipulate them by th mathematics, theory, or you can have your computer manipulate them, but it's pretty hard to manipulate them by hand. All right, so these are relations. And uh, OK, so this is more or less half the lecture. And for the second half, we are going to discuss three questions that come from that. And so I think these questions should be uh, pretty standard, pretty clear from the theorem. The first is, that do the Faber-Zaghi relations span the ideal of all Kappa relations? This is the first question. I mean, that's, this, is a, this is a question that's uh, clear and unstated in some sense in the, in the theorem. Then how are they proven? Because the way that they, the, the way I presented it, that uh, the hypergeometric series comes from nowhere. And, Finally, we were talking so far about the cohomology of the moduli space, but in fact, there's this very natural delene mumford compactification. And you can ask, what does this uh, exploration in the interior have to do with the full cohomology? So these are three questions, and I will discuss them for the, the second part of the lecture. All right, so the, the Q linear span of these faber zaghi relations determines an ideal. This uh, ideal with this FZ to say from, from the uh, faber zaghi relations. And by the theorem, the one I stated, that's this, this theorem. So by the theorem, this ideal, this faber zaghi ideal sits inside the full ideal. So that's the same thing as saying we've proven that they are actually relations. So the question A, the first question, is just the same as saying, is this the full idea of a relation? So the answer, the answer is that for G less than 24, this is known, and the answer is yes, and this is, can be proven, um, well, it requires some theory, but also requires some computer work, and uh, I will not discuss it, but this is known. And for genus G greater or equal to 24, it's unknown. So, and you could ask, maybe we should look for other relations. And of course, people have been looking very hard for other relations, and uh, despite serious effort, and there have been many different geometric methods. Clater, Faber, Yanda, Yin, Randall Williams. No relation not in this set has ever been found. Uh, so the conjecture in the subject is that this set is the entire set of relations. So this is a, somehow some experimental evidence for that conjecture. Uh, but there, there is also some conceptual idea of why this could be true. And uh, so as presented, as I said, that these relations appear from nowhere. But uh, in fact, in the path of the proof, there, uh, this set arises as something conceptual. And, and, and where it lives is in this uh, world of semi-simple cohomological co field theories. And I will say a little bit about this, but I'll point out that my article for the proceedings is, is all about semi-simple cohomological field theories. OK, so then question B, what is the path of the proof? So we know by now three proofs. So that was the original one in 2010, and then two more. And all of them uh, require some aspects of gromov witten theory or the virtual fundamental class, some aspects uh, that was beyond the classical tools in the theory of curves. And so to say a little bit about them, the second proof, that's in 2013, uh, this uses uh, 
an object called Witten's three-spin class. It's a, it's a class constructed on the modular space of curves plus more or less a third root of the canonical bundle. It's a, a little bit strange modular space to now come here. And but this has been, there's been a development about this uh, and the mathematical side of the development, so it started with uh, papers of Witten and the mathematical side by Polishuk and Weintraub. So it uses this three-spin theory, a particular cohomological field theory, and then together with this given tall telemann classification of semi-simple cohomological field theories. If you put these things together, out will come this faber zagier relations, and I will say a little bit about that. That's the second proof. And then a little bit later, Yanda proved that, that these relations are actually found in all suitable semi-simple cohomological field theories. They all yield these relations. And this, uh, these relations are a very natural set from that point of view. So I would like to say a little bit about this. But as I said, that, so I will say, uh, the discussion here of uh, cohomological field theories will be a bit brief, but if you're interested, you should look at the proceedings article. So what is a cohomological field theory? So we start with a Q-vector space with an inner product. And the cohomological field theory is a set of Q-linear maps. So it's one for every genus and number of points, and it maps the nth tensor product of this vector space into the cohomology. So it's, uh, it's a lot of data. It's data for an infinite number of, 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 of genus, genera, and points, and all of these linear maps. So it's quite a lot of data. And it comes with a, a list of axioms. And here I just stay here, several axioms of compatibility with the boundary. So this moduli space has various boundary inclusions. and for the cohomological field theory, we insist on compatibility of all of these boundary inclusions. It's not so hard to define this, but uh, I will not do it. The simplest uh, part of this is, of course, the genus zero part. And if I take the genus zero three-pointed map, that's this gamma zero three, so I remind you here, this gamma gn, that's this gamma gn is the map from the nth tensor product to the cohomology of the moduli space of curves. Ah, sorry, omega. <laughs> so if I take this omega uh, zero three, we get the quantum product. So this omega zero three, I can put in three vectors. And out of this three vectors comes a class on the moduli space of uh, genus zero curves with three points. And that we knew was a point. So what happens here, this is actually a number. And this number de determines uh, a product on the vector space, the star product, by this formula using the inner product. So the, the simplest piece of this cohomological field theory uh, determines an algebra structure on the vector space. And when this is a semi-simple algebra, that's very special, that's this case of a, 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 a semi-simple cohomological field theory, then there uh, is a theorem, this given tall telemann classification, which tells you how to go to the higher genus from the genus zero data and a certain R matrix that's somehow central to the theory. And as I said, this, this, uh, the discussion here is explained uh, in many places, and I don't want to give a detailed explanation here. But what's important here for the story of the faber zagier relations is that if I take the three-spin cohomological field theory, this three-spin cohomological field theory has a specific R matrix, and if you look at what that R matrix is, this is, and this R matrix is determined by solving some differential equations. If you actually go look at what that R matrix is, then it's given by these functions, odd and even, where we take this series, B0 of T, that's exactly the series that came up in the faber zagier relations, and this is take the even coefficients of it, and, the, and uh, sorry, that's taking the even coefficients of it, and this is taking the odd coefficients. And also, exactly the second function. That's exactly the second one that came in the faber uh equations. And they, it occurs here, and it also it's odd and even parts. So these are precisely the same series. This is the second time that they appear in, in this talk. So you can imagine that this cannot be complete accident, that, they, that these exactly this hypergeometric function occurs in, in, in this theory of the uh, three-spin co-FT, co and also in the faber zagier relations, and indeed it's not an accident. So for this three-spin co-FT, this vector space is actually two 
uh, two dimensions, and you can view these two as roughly saying that in the Faber-Zaguet relations, there were three numbers mod three, but we took out one, and we're left with two numbers mod three. And these are the more or less these two numbers. And in fact, they are zero mod three and one mod three. And it turns out geometrically that this uh, CoFT, the omega here, is of pure dimension. It lives in a pure place here. This fra yeah, anyway, if this, if this fraction is, if this fraction is not an integer, then this uh, is zero. However, this given, given tall Telemann classification generates a CoFT of impure dimension. And if you put those descriptions together, there must be vanishing, and those vanishing is exactly the faber zaghi relation. So in fact, this is a somewhat a pretty conceptual and simple uh, explanation. And in fact, if you look back to how, what happens in the Grassmannian, you can express those relations, if you know about the Grassmannian, also as purity and impurity of, uh, of churn classes. That, so in some sense, it's some, something like that. So Yanda used the same mechanism as the pole cancellation result. So pole cancellations are required by the structure of every suitable semi-simple CoFT as a non-semi-simple limit is taken. So this is, again, there's a lot to explain here, but uh, the outcome of this is if you take any semi-simple CoFT with some, some uh, convergence properties, then as you take this uh, limit, up to a non-semi-simple point, out will come exactly the faber zaghi relations, that they are required for this theory. OK, so that's the, uh, so that's the end of the part about the, the proof of the faber zaghi relations and where they live in mathematics, which is one can say they live in the structure of uh, semi-simple CoFTs. And this gives us a different kind of uh, approach to the idea why they might be all of them. They're not some random set of relations. But that's uh, still an open question. So the third question that uh, uh, in the second half of the talk is this, the relations to the cohomology of MGN bar. So, so far, I have spoken uh, about the interior MG. But there's a very nice compactification due to Deline and Mumford. And uh, it parameterizes not just uh, a non-singular curve or a Riemann surface. But it allows degenerations. And the degenerations are very specific degenerations. They're nodal degenerations. And they're not all nodal degenerations. They're stable nodal degenerations. So there's a stability condition here, which says more or less when I have a Riemann sphere, I have to put some points on it, and so on. So here's a picture. If I, if I, if I have some high genus, some complicated object like this might be uh, parameterized in this moduli space. and what, but, by this, I mean the points live in various places, and each component here is the Riemann surface, has a complex structure. So on the moduli space, the, on the compactification, there are different classes. So we saw in the interior there were these kappa classes that came by the twisting of the universal curve. But on the moduli space, there's also a different source of classes, which is the boundary. Because we've put all these classes, that we've, put, we've put all these cycles in the boundary, and they give us very natural classes. And they correspond to stable graphs. And here I've tried to draw uh, this correspondence. So on the left-hand side, imagine this is a, a, a particular uh, curve. So this means it's a genus 2 curve here with some complex structure. This is a Riemann surface. And then it has some mark points. The mark points are required to be distinct. They can never be nodes. So there's this, uh, this, uh, this object here. And this is a very complicated object, because it, it has, which I cannot draw, the complex structure here. And also these points. So this is a, to, to say what this is is a quite compli complicated object. You have to give a lot of data to specify. On the right-hand side, I've made a certain simplification. So here is just a graph. It's a very simple object. And all the data is in the picture. I take this genus 2 curve, and I reduce it to a point. And I write a little 2 next to it to, rem to remember that it's a genus is 2. This is a genus 0. It's a Riemann surface. I reduce it also to a point, And I write a little 0 by it. And then I'll ha I also want to know where the mark points go. Well, this mark point goes to the genus, is on the genus 2 curve, so I attach it here. 
And these two mark points, they are on the genus zero part, so I attached it there. So this is just a graph. There's no hidden data here. So we've lost a lot of data. Here's another example where I have a genus one, a genus zero. And this is a more interesting example because it's a, it's a, a curve that has a node. And that node is represented by a loop in the graph. So every, every curve here has a topological type. And that topological type is exactly reflected by this data that I remember in the graph. All right. And what's very important now for our cycles is that if I pick such a graph, then I can, let, I can define a cycle in the moduli space. And that cycle is just the closure of the stratum that's a, that have that topological type. So this is, a, this is a new supply of classes. So before, for when we were just looking at smooth curves, we just had the kappa classes, which is about how the universal curve is twisting. But then when we go to the moduli space as the lean Mumford and compactification, we have all these new classes. They're very natural, which is, uh, corresponds to all these classes in the boundary. And in any interesting theory, you can imagine that these are going to play a fundamental role. And I should point out while I'm here is that if I fix the G and N, you can ask, well, how many different graphs can, I, can happen? And the answer is that, well, only finally many gra graphs can happen because the graphs, these started with a stability condition and then this puts a stability condition on the graphs. And if you think about it, only finally many graphs can happen. So this, this graphical language is, is in some sense just a way, sorry. This graphical language is just a way of indexing the strata in the boundary of the moduli space of curves. OK. So to each stable graph, gamma, we'll associate the moduli space, which is the product of all the moduli spaces and the vertices. Those graphs had these numbers, which was the genus, and they had some legs that came out. So each vertex of the graph corresponds to a moduli space. And then there's a canonical morphism from the product moduli spaces of the vertices to the moduli space of curves obtained by gluing. So this whole thing is just a complicated way of saying what this uh, cycle is. This is the cycle that's the closure of uh, all the curves that have that topological type. You can write this in fancier notation as the push forward of a certain moduli space, the moduli space of products for every vertex divided by the automorphism group of the graph. That's not such a important thing. OK, so now the question becomes, we take the deline mumford compactification. We have all these cycles. Is there any way we can put order to the relations among them? This cohomological question. And the first boundary relation, the first relation one finds in the subject is exactly this one. So here's the cycle. This is a certain boundary member of M04 bar. And the relation is that this boundary member is equal to that boundary member in the cohomology. Uh, this relation is uh, equivalent to our understanding of M04 at the beginning of the lecture and is essentially the cross ratio. And you could say, OK, well, what happens for higher n, for M0 n bar? And so that's an interesting question, but it turns out that uh, through work of Sean Keel and others, in fact, this is the only relation you need to know. That explains all the relations that will happen in genus zero. There's no more. So Pappas of Alexandria had already found them all. OK, so that's the genus zero th uh, theory. So, but then what happens in higher genus? And the first interesting relation was found by Ezra Getzler in 1996. So uh, this was in Chicago. I was also in Chicago there then. So we used to talk, and this, this is an uh, amazing thing. And here's my friend Ezra Getzler, and he's looking down on his relation here. Uh, so here it is. This is the, somehow the first step beyond the cross ratio in this theory. And you can see this is a non, kind of a non-trivial object. It occurs in genus 1 with four points in co-dimension 4. And uh, these are all the graphs that happen. So I discussed these graphs very carefully. But when you see this graph, for example, this is the locus of a genus one curve and then two Riemann spheres. And then these are where the mark points are. You'll notice that I did not 
put numbers on these mark points, and it's because in this notation you're supposed to symmetrize over all the numbers. All right, so this is a, this is a very non-trivial relation, a very beautiful relation. And you, even if you look at the coefficients, they are not bad-looking numbers at all. And after Ezra found this, there was a, a lot of work on these relations and tried to find, of course, once there is one interesting one, one imagine there should be a whole, uh, there should be the beginning of a whole story of interesting relations. And indeed, that's true. The, uh, there, of course, there are more, but these relations are not easy to find. The next one was found a, a few years later. In fact, Ezra told us where to look. This was found with Belaruski in 1998. I found it. And it's in genus 2, and here it is. It's uh, already much more complicated. You have all these graphs and the points and these uh, nice numbers. So at, at this point, it looks like the subject has entered some kind of a place of chaos where uh, there are some relations somewhere and when you find them they have uh, they're described in terms of these graphs and these graphs are well there's just a lot of data and a lot of coefficients but one thing that is true if you look at the coefficients the coefficients don't look like such bad numbers the denominators are uh, small primes etc this is a so the questions to ask at this point are again kind of uh, Simple questions. The first is, are there any structure to these formulas? That's a very reasonable question. And now, this discussion seems completely orthogonal to what was happening with the faber zagier relations, because this is the faber zagier relations were on the interior of MG. And here, we're now talking about relations in the boundary. So in some kind of explicit sense, it's almost a complementary discussion. So a question that's not obvious to ask, although in retrospect is completely clear, but at the time was not obvious, is, is there a connection to the faber zagier relation? This is a very interesting question. I mean, the arguments against this are that here, as I said, here we're talking about the boundary while the faber zagier is about the kappa. Uh, the second thing is that there's no kappa classes here. But anyway, actually, it turns out the answer is yes, and this was found by Aaron Pixton, and this is the, the last part of the lecture will be about this yes. So here I describe the set of Pixton's relations, which this, this is a, a set that unites everything. It unites the faber zagier on the interior, what we, the, the sporadic series that were found in the boundary, Getzler's relation, what relation I found, and relations that everyone else has found too. This puts everything together on one footing. And uh, so this Pixens relation takes the form of a certain relation being zero. This is R, D, G, and A. And we have to say a little bit about what these things are. So first of all, we're going to work on the moduli space of genus G curves with N mark points. So we have G and N, just as has been always the case in the lecture, the genus and the number of mark points. Then this relation requires some data. That's this vector a. This vector a is a vector for, with an integer from for n, to n integers here, one for every mark point. But each one is just 0, 1. So it's just a, a vector of binary numbers. And this 0, 1 is the same 0, 1 that's been going through the talk. It was the, the congruence classes that were not 2 mod 3. That's also 0, 1. It was also the 0, 1 that comes up in the uh, Witten's three-spin theory, which I didn't discuss, but that also has the zero one in it. It's the same zero one. And a D, D is gonna, going to be where the relation holds, what the co-dimension. So this is this Pixens relation has a, a D, which tells you where it is, the genus, and it has this vector A, which it tells you how many points and, and assigns a zero one to each point. And we have this degree bound. And then the relation takes the form that, that's actually just zero. So the interesting thing about this relation is this specific, there's an exact formula for this, uh, for this relation, and it requires a bit more detail that I can give here, but the shape can easily be shown. And it, the, I will show you the shape. It's not hard to write the whole, the whole thing out, but uh, instead I prefer here just to show you the shape. The shape is very, a very appealing shape. So we've already seen these th two series twice. They came up in the faber zagier relations. They came up in the R matrix of this given tall telemann theory. And now they come a third time. They come up in Pixton's relations. 
This is the third, the, the, the third appearance of these functions. So by now you should recognize them. They're old friends, and there's now maybe a sign change here, but it, it's, the, it's the same series. So as I said, these series control the original set to faber zagier relations, and they will also control Pixton's relations. So here I had said before that if I fix a G and N, there's a finite set of stable graphs because of the stability condition. And we'll let that finite set be G, as, as uh, described by this big capital G. And for example, if I take G12, this set has five elements. You can just play with the graph, how many gen degenerations. And I've written them out here for you, this picture. OK, so the formula for uh, Pixton's relation, this RDGA, is a sum over all stable graphs. And in some sense, this has to be the case in the sense that we have in this moduli space, there's all these graphs, and we have to account for every single boundary component. So the formula is going to be sum over all these stable graphs. And for each stable graph, we put the class. This is the class of that stratum. And that class of the stratum has two interesting features. Well, one, it has this uh, uh, power of 2. This is not such a big deal, because h1 of gamma comes from vertices and uh, edges, and I could put that in in other ways. But anyway, it's nice to write it this way. But the thing that's really interesting, it, it'll have classes that occur from the vertices of the graph, the legs of the graph, and the edges. Uh, so the graphs, so it's going to be some of our graphs. I said this is, in some sense, uh, any formula in the modular space of curves has this sum over all these strata. And the, uh, the factor, the, the coefficient of that sum is in some sense, the, it comes a, in some sense the most conceptually simple way, which means that you don't need to know about uh, very long interactions in the graph. The way that this graph enters is by product over the vertices, edges, and legs. The legs are the marked points. So it's by local contributions of these features. And then we can just write a formula for it. So let me just say here. So here, if, we, if, we remind, if I remind you that this moduli space, m gamma, is the moduli space associated to this graph gamma, the product over all the vertex, vertex moduli spaces, then these uh, three features, the, the vertex factor, the leg factor, and the edge factor, are explicit cohomology elements in this moduli space. And what occurs in this uh, uh, Pixin formula is the push forward to the moduli space from this boundary element of a product over vertex factors, leg factors, and edge factors. And of course, there's always the automorphism factor. And finally, what is this d? Well, we have to extract the dimension d part. All right. So in, in some sense, the last step to tell you precisely what this uh, Pixin formula is to give you a formula for every one of these three things. And uh, this is easy to do, but I have chosen here, so there's this vertex edge factor of explicit formulas. Every one of them has completely explicit formulas, and uh, they, did, they relate to these formulas have these kappa classes that we've seen, also the cotangent line classes. And what's, in, what's uh, crucial about it is that these, formula, these factors have explicit formulas in terms of our two series, no other thing, just those two series. So it would be natural now to give the uh, formula for every one of these. And as I said, they're, they're, they have very similar feature. And the formulas get uh, uh, more and more complicated. But the simplest one, um, actually, actually the most complicated one, but the, the one that's most interesting is the edge factor, because that's what occurs in the boundary that we have not seen in the, uh, in the interior. So the edge factor, if I have an edge in this graph, that corresponds to a node. And this edge factor is a rather interesting thing. It, it corresponds to the node. And geometrically, this node has two sides. Because a node occurs as the intersection of two, component, two local components. And those two local components have cotangent lines, cotangent line class for this side and the cotangent line for that side. And in Pixton's formula, we will see the edge term. This is the one I will explain. The other ones you can look up if you're interested in the paper. This edge term. The formula for the edge factor is this uh, very beautiful expression. Now, what could this mean? So here is this is that uh, this is the, these two are series. They're series and variables. And I, now I put them around in different ways. So I remind you here that these cotangent line classes are cotangent lines on the two sides. 
So you put this, this cotangent line class, which is a cohomology class, into the series. And then you do it the other way. And then you divide by the sum. Now, division by cohomology classes is not a legal operation. So the only way this could work is if the numerator is divisible by the denominator. And that, it turns out that's true. That's one of the properties of this uh, series. That the, in, when I write this formally, the numerator is divisible by the denominator, so here's the beginning of it. And to prove the numerator is divisible by the denominator is exactly this identity. This is a, a, a specific identity among those series, which you can go explore yourself. But it's actually crucial for the whole theory, this works. This, has a, this, this identity is not also, it has explanation. It comes when I, uh, in the second time the series appeared, they appeared as this R matrix, and this identity uh, occurs as a certain symplectic property of that R matrix. But it's needed crucially to define the edge term. Okay, and I've simplified this in many ways. If you actually want to run this and get things correct, you have to go look at the papers. All right, so the theorem, so Pixon conjectured these, and the theorem with myself, Pixon, and Zvonkin in 2013 is that these relations hold. So if I fix any genus in N, any vector of these AIs, and any D in this range, this precise summation over boundary stratas, kappas, and gammas is exactly zero. Uh, so the proof actually is, is uses this co-FT path, and the, it's, the proof, it, it, in some sense, the idea of the proof is that this Faber the second proof of the Faber Zagay actually extends to the boundary in the co-FT language. And the outcome is naturally this set of Pixton's relation. And this theorem captures everything we've seen before. It captures uh, Pappas's Krauss ratio, Getzler's relation, all the genus 0 theory, all the Faber Zagay. Ca ca this captures every relation that we've ever seen. And uh, this whole talk was in cohomology, if you're interested in algebraic cycles. Actually, Yanda has proven that Pixton's relations hold for, and Chow for algebraic cycles also. So here are uh, Aaron Pixton, Dimitri Zonkin, and Felix Yanda. All right, so I'm almost done here. So Mumford, in his foundational paper towards the denominative geometry of the moduli space of curves, he opened the study of these tautological classes. With these Pixton's relations, we find the first proposal for their calculus parallel to the Schubert calculus, meaning that this is a proposed set, full set of equations. But there, is, um, there are many things to do in this subject, and if you've been following the photos in this uh, talk, that the mathematicians are becoming younger and younger and younger in these photos, so there's room for you in this subject also. The questions are, are these relations the complete set of relations? This is unknown. No one has ever found a relation that's not in this. And the second is maybe a more philosophical question. Is there an abstract algebraic structure which realizes exactly this set of relations? OK, so I'll stop here. I just point out this, this photo of the passion flower was taken by a former student of mine, Christo. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. This was a beautiful uh, survey talk. Uh, now, uh, due to lack of time, uh, if you have any questions, please uh, talk to him uh, uh, privately. And uh, uh, this is the end of the section. But uh, let's thank the speaker again.